welcome to this video in this session on a clamp course uh, for cdcs we shall have a quick look at the money laundering and terrorist financing aspects related to trade finance and documentary credits <coughs> <coughs> what is money laundering money laundering are or is the phrase used to refer to all the set of techniques comprehensively the techniques used to conceal either the origin of money maybe it is illegally obtained or the purpose for which it is used maybe because it is for illegal purposes so when a money is moved from in from one form to another through the financial institutions across the countries and with the purpose of concealing either the origin or the destination use it is called money laundering many of the times it is used either for funding terrorist activities or it is obtained from illicit sources the purpose or the function is to disguise or confuse the audit trail so that we will not be able to find out who is the real owner or the real beneficiary or the real uh, <coughs> user of the assets concerned one of the most important or the most popular methods is to purchase real estate or commodity or bullion or gems and diamonds they will be purchasing this at a very high inflated price and selling it back on the open market in the, the current market price the difference being the conversion of the black money into white another method could be cash deposits and the cash deposits are mostly popular in jurisdictions with greater bank secrecy so that we will not be able to find out who is the ultimate person who deposited the cash or into whose account the cash has been deposited <coughs> it is also popular in jurisdictions where there is less money laundering regulation when the money laundering regulation is not uh, very uh, robust then using cash for laundering money is a bit easier another method is undervaluing and overvaluing invoices this is where uh, one of the um, one of the areas where trade is used or letter of credit is used when a trade is used and uh, collections or um, credit is used as a method of payment it gives more legitimacy to the transaction accordingly goods worth 100 if it is shown as 200 then uh, 200 dollars will pass through a letter of credit mechanism and the recipient of the funds can show it as a legal earnings for some trade that has happened through LC. so undervaluing and overvaluing of invoices is one method where funds will flow or how um, funds could flow for illicit purposes or in an illicit fashion Yet another popular method is using of shell companies and trusts. So, and these shell companies and trusts could most probably be registered in locations where there is a very, uh, very little and brittle legislation. And so, the beneficial owner of these uh, companies and their activities will not be disclosed to the public at large across the world. Uh, very infrequently used but a very powerful method is the capture of NFI, the capture of uh, exchange houses or capture of banks or capture of remittance agencies. So what happens is when a terrorist organization has g g gained control of a, an organization like a exchange house or a bank or a remittance house, they will be able to circumvent scrutiny and launder large amounts of money by sending them across <coughs> the globe the method that they adopt is to make the transaction look normal it is to make people believe that everything is legitimate and everything is usual but the actual purpose or the actual intention will be to launder money or to convert illicit money into legal ones or convert legal money and send it across for illicit purposes the financial support for terrorist activities could come from various means the financial support could be from illegal or legal sources that is individuals or institutions who had earned illegal money by legitimate businesses could send their money to support financial uh, financial support to terrorist activities or it could be the organization itself engaged in legitimate trading activities so the money could from individuals institutions or states these individuals or institutions would have earned the money legally or would have earned the money illegally 
and if they have earned legally and if they are sending it for supporting terrorist activity it is money laundering if they have earned illegally and if they are sending money across then using of illegal source for any purposes including terrorist activity is again a criminal offense and then the terrorist organization might itself be engaged in legitimate trading activities so the organization may be doing some sort of legitimate business as a cover and using that legitimate business they will be earning a lot of revenue and they will be using that revenue for illicit purposes that's it so what a banker could do to help prevent this or control this or curtail this the first of all is the process and procedures related to know your customer the banker should know who is his customer to which applicant he is opening lc to which beneficiary is advising lc to who is confirming the lc things like that and when it is know that when you know your customer then you have to know their customer know your customer's customer that is with which counterparty your customer is dealing why he is dealing with this counterparty what is the underlying business of these two parties what is their underlying relationship why they are associated with themselves and how is their business associated with the global trade so know your customer know your customer's customer know your business and know your customer's business so these are the important things that a banker could do to try to uh, control and curtail money laundering these are called the anti money laundering process or procedure in most of the banks now the banker in his capacity as a trade finance practitioner or a documentary credit examiner will have to also exercise due diligence at both customer level and transaction level just because you know your customer and their counterparty does not uh, mean that you have done the um, complete requirements we will have to exercise extra caution at each and every transaction level also to check whether there is an undervaluing or overvaluing of the invoices to check whether the party is dealing with an unknown or unrelated counterparty to check whether the shipment of goods is from or to or through a jurisdiction which is considered as a high risk or irrelevant to the particular goods that is being handled to check whether the parties are um, the parties known to us are in particular locations but the addresses given for their purposes is in undisclosed locations so all these things will have to be the ex uh, additional um, caution will have to be exercised both at the transaction level as well as the customer level and we have to understand the nature of the underlying transaction what trade is happening under this letter of credit why is this buying or selling or shipment happening and how it is happening and through where it is happening the relationship between the parties whether a charter party bill is used so that the, there will be no known carrier is there a waiver of who will issue the charter party bill suppose if the charter party bill or a normal bill requirement signing if the parties are willing to waive under credit that means uh, any tom dick and harry can issue a bill or anything issued as a bill will be taken which means the bill is re not reliable which means the document is not really document to title which means maybe there is no underlying goods which means that it is a fraudulent transaction with no goods moving but only money moving so there could be so many things so um, exercising diligence at the transaction level it's also important examination of documents with respect to UCP with respect to the documentary credit with respect to the um, intra discrepancy on the stipulated documents is what is basically called for our explanations or interpretations of the rules to be applied is available only in the ISBP 19745 as a um, as a compiled document and what the trade practitioners use internationally in global trade but but beyond ucp there is a duty on the document examiner to ensure that at the transaction level there is no attempt to bypass the regulations of the nation involved there is no attempt to bypass the sanctions or anti money laundering or money laundering prevention restrictions that the central bank and the governments place on the banks and other financial institutions that is also to be checked so every attempt should be made at the transaction level both the, and at the customer level that the beneficial owners or parties involved are identifiable and whatever information we have we have to keep records of those transactions for long years to what extent can an issuing bank depend on the correspondent bank to do the boss scrutiny or in other words when we use a particular correspondent bank bank abc in country xyc will the country xyc and the bank abc together be able to help you with ensuring these aspects you may be in a high uh, regulatory um, in a jurisdiction where there is a very high level of jurisdiction you may be having a very strict control about what you are doing but will the counterparty will also have suppose you issue an lc do all this kyc kyc c and all those things and transfer send the lc to a bank and that bank as an omnitrated bank or a transferring bank is not able to comply with this level of strict kyc kyc c kyb or kyc b and then they transfer it further to another jurisdiction which is still less capable of uh, controlling money laundering in this fashion then you run a risk of handling a transaction which might be not genuine or not authentic or not legal 
but on the face of it it may appear that everything is okay so there are there are certain high risk countries the countries where the rules to prevent money laundering the rules to prevent money laundering are insufficiently robust which means what they are not very strict which means that they are less regulated which means that regulation is very fluid and liquid and volatile and so in those high risk countries it is possible to have various transactions which could easily facilitate money laundering or which could not prevent terrorist financing the fight against money laundering and fight against terrorism that is called uh, um, ctf counter terrorism financing or uh, aml anti money laundering there are legislations and regulations in various countries and there are also certain international regulations so maybe organizations like united nations will issue guidelines to the countries what to do and there are un resolutions which has to be complied 100% by all the signatory countries these are force of law these are called maybe economic sanctions also and there are certain recommendations issued by fatf which is called gati in uh, french the financial action task force and in 1990 onwards they had started issuing recommendations to the financial institutions as to how they should conduct themselves to prevent money laundering especially trade based or banking transaction based money laundering and how we can fight this terrorism financing now national legislation places a personal responsibility on each and individual as well as the institution to report suspicious transaction it is called str suspicious transaction reporting and there is an financial intelligence unit fiu in each central bank and each central bank is expecting the um, financial institutions and banks in that country to report to them the financial transactions which are considered suspicious which are considered to be involving either terrorist financing or money laundering and the responsibility to report these is a personal responsibility on every individual it is an offense it is an offense to do certain things offense to do what are those things <clears throat> to control the assets it's an offense to control certain assets what type of assets which you have reasonable grounds to suspect are proceeds of crime if you are remitting a money suppose and if you consider or if you suspect that that money that you are remitting is controlled by a party who is having links to terrorism or this money is a proceeds of crime or this money is used for financing crime it is coming from crime or it is going to crime or it is used by somebody who is as who has a relevance or relationship with the crime and if a party who is controlling those assets the proceeds of crime or the um sources for uh, funding crime is asking you to remit the money and if you are assisting them if you assist someone who is controlling such assets then it's an offense you as an individual you as an institution will be subject to having committed such a crime so the if the funds are intended to support terrorism or illegal activities if the funds are proceeds of the crime and if somebody is having control of those assets and if as an institution you are supporting that uh, party who is having control of those assets then it is an offense what else is an offense failure to report this transaction is an effect and tipping off is also an effect you have to report this transaction to the mm, intelligence units and if you inform the customer that you are reporting it or if you are having suspicion of the transaction that is also an offense so the bank's obligation under documentary credit versus responsibility under the national regulations if you compare the responsibility under na national regulations will take a precedence and will have a higher power of force than your obligation under a documentary credit subject to ucp ucp is a voluntary set of rules drawn up by icc for guidance uniform application across all banks and parties and others involved but the national regulations are legislations which every individual institutions as well as corporate citizens will have to comply with the bank will have to keep record bank will have to keep record of relevant copies of the documents for a reasonable period for the regulators to examine in some countries the record keeping will have to be between 7 to 5 to 7 years individuals and institutions will also have to take steps to file the suspicious transaction report with initially with the designated aml or money laundering prevention officer anti money laundering officer money laundering prevention officer so that they will decide whether it has to be further taken up with the central bank or with the government or with which law enforcement agencies the failure will lead to not only changes in the um will lead to damage in the bank's reputation that is okay you will pay a 500 million penalty to some agency and come out of that but you, there will be criminal proceedings against you which as an individual and as an official of the bank you will have to face for not acting as per these regulatory requirements 
there are certain economic sanctions and these sanctions are on sometimes on countries on individuals or sometimes on institutions now most of these economic sanctions take the take the form of trade transactions these sanctions are intended not to permit those countries to benefit from the money from abroad or enable that country to send money abroad uh, some of the examples could be the present day sanctions on north korea or iran and things like that where because the world body the united nations as well as a set of other leading uh, top 5 g5 nations or g10 nations feel that these countries are not cooperating to a combat international state sponsored terrorism or b not willing to put in place uh, regulations or restrictions on the activities of individuals and institutions which are not in the interest of the nation as a whole suppose you are developing nuclear weapons then uh, as a, as a united nations the world body feels that you are not cooperating with international agencies then there may be economic sanctions against uh, the country the organizations that is building the nuclear uh, um, uh, weapon or whatever developing the nuclear technology and the individuals associated with the uh, ruling regime who is supporting this uh, nuclear uh, uh, proliferation the parties who are not supporting the nuclear non proliferation treaty so they will have economic sanctions against them they will not be allowed to do trade they will not be allowed to receive money from overseas they will not be allowed to send goods or money overseas so these are the things and maybe there are at sometimes some small concessions like the united nations famous oil for food program of iraq uh, prior to the kuwait and iraq war uh, which is now infamous for so many other things but something like that where the united nations will say because the individual people in the country are suffering we will allow them to have humanitarian aid like food or medicines and things like that but as a country you will not be able to trade in say oil you will not be trade in uh, some other thing you will not be able to receive any machinery you will not be able to receive any high profile technology or high profile uh, state of art uh, equipments like that so when there are such trade transactions the rockmeter credit examiner and bankers will have to ensure that they are complying with such international guidance on sanctions and restrictions and boycotts and ensure that their letter of credit transaction just by their complying with ucp does not lead into non compliance with any other regulation so banks are seeking to incorporate sanctions clauses into the dc the clause will say subject to sanctions we may not be able to advise your lc we may not be able to handle documents under your lc we may not be able to effect payment under your under the dc that you are having so icc had issued a guidance paper in march 2010 icc had issued a guidance paper with respect to sanctions clauses icc had had such clauses cast doubt such clauses had uncertainty to the credit what is a credit credit is an unconditional irrevocable undertaking to pay against compliant documents evidencing um conformance with the terms and conditions given there it is a promise it's a promise by an issuing bank and now you are saying you may not be able to pay so it will cast doubt and add uncertainty to the undertaking given by the bank issuing bank and confirming bank and because it will cast that and it will undermine the value of the letter of credit as a product as a instrument as a international trade facilitator payment mechanism and so icc had said banks may desist from using this why because whether you put this clause or not everybody in the world is aware that the national regulations take precedence over the ucp guidance and so if there is an um if there is an evidence that you are doing anti money laundering or counter terrorism through the trade and then it is considered as a fraud or because you are breaching the national regulations and when you breach the national regulations that is what will take the force of effect on the transaction and not the protection of ucp sanctions are a force of law it will override all the rules of ucp or any other guidance given by any other organizations national or international sanctions should not give banks description whether or not to pay and accordingly if a transaction is subject to sanction if you do an aml check and nor sanctions check and if you find the entities are associated with it then you will not handle the transaction further and you will not help them to realize the proceeds and you will not be getting any protection under ucp because national regulations are more forceful thanks for watching this video please keep